Hello again. Today I'm going to try and show you why I believe that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of the living God. Okay, you guys like science, right? Let's do some science. Alright, so how would I go about proving to you that the Bible was not just written by mortal man, but in fact inspired by God? A few thousand years ago, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 22, it was written, He, God, sits enthroned above the sphere of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He, God, stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Okay, so this was written thousands of years ago, and it's saying the world is spherical and that the heavens, the universe, is stretching. We only recently discovered that, in fact, the universe is constantly expanding, and up until, you know, I think, what was it, Christopher Columbus, however long ago, he discovered that the earth was spherical. But the Bible said it all along, especially during a time that most people thought the world was flat. How do you explain that? Oh, and it gets better than that. Check this out. Okay, here we go. Book of Job. This was actually one of the oldest books in the Bible, so this was probably over 3,000 years old. Book of Job, chapter 26, verse 7. He spreads out the northern skies over empty space, and he suspends the earth over nothing. Nothing. How in the world did a man know that the world was floating in space thousands of years ago? Impossible. Especially in a culture that believed that the earth was actually flat, held up on the back of elephants. This is completely revolutionary for the time, and there is no way that the person writing this could have known that. Another way to prove that the Bible is truly a reliable source is archaeology. This was found in the mountains of Ararat. It matches the exact size and scale of the description of Noah's Ark given in the Bible. It is resting in the mountains of Ararat, which is where the Bible said the Ark was to rest. And here it is. How can we know that this is Noah's Ark? Quite simply. On the side of the leftovers of the Ark, you can see deck timbers. At the site, were found giant anchor stones, also called drogue stones. Also notice the giant carved-in crosses on the stones, which are probably for each of the survivors. Twelve or more of these stones were found at the site. This is a computer-generated image of the anchor stones in use on the Ark. They would be very important to keep the Ark stable during a storm. If you want to learn more about the Ark, go to arkdiscovery.com. Further archaeological proof in the Bible's favor is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. If you haven't heard of this, Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities full of homosexual and immoral activities. So, God rained down fire and brimstone and destroyed the inhabitants of the city and the city itself. Okay, so, on the cliffs here, it looks like what could be the remains of a city. When archaeologists went to go dig in this city, they found the entire place riddled with golf ball sized sulfur balls. Pure sulfur. In the brick here, you can see it peppered with sulfur balls. It literally rained fire and brimstone on this city. One of the most famous stories in all of antiquity is the story of the Exodus where Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. God appeared to the Israelites above Mount Sinai as a cloud of fire. Now a giant cloud of fire would likely scorch the mountain. So if we can find a mountain scorched black as if burnt by fire where the Exodus took place, that is likely Mount Sinai. And we found it. Here is Mount Sinai the top of which is charred black, as if burnt by fire. Also, there's a story that Moses struck a rock and water came gushing out. So, we should be able to find a stone split in half with erosion marks indicating that water gushed out of the stone. And we did. Here is a five-story rock split in half. When we go into for closer observation, we can see that there are erosion marks protruding out of this crack, as if water had gushed out. Below this rock 
is what is seemingly the remains of a dried up river stretching for miles and miles. You may come across some Muslims that say, but the Quran has science in it too. Yes, it does. I admit it. No problem. The Bible was completed 600 years before the Quran, which is the Islamic text, and most of the science in the Quran can be found in the Bible, which is where they stole their ideas from. However, the Bible has something the Quran does not, and it's called prophecy. The Bible, it's a thick book, right? The Bible is a couple hundred pages, probably close to 2,000, and one-third of the Bible is prophecy, predictions of the future. In an earlier video, I explained that God is the creator of time, so he exists outside of time, meaning God knows the future. So, the true fingerprint of God is his ability to predict the future with 100% accuracy, which the Bible has always done, but the Quran and no other religious text can do that, only the Bible. Let's look at some prophecy. The very cornerstone of fulfilled prophecy is actually Jesus Christ himself. I'm going to point my camera at my computer screen now and just show you a list of everything Jesus Christ fulfilled. These are predictions made well before Christ. I don't expect you to be able to read them. I just want you to see the magnitude of fulfilled prophecies in the person of Jesus Christ. I'll actually supply you with the website so you can check this out after. It's just absolutely ridiculous. It's over 360 prophecies. It's crazy. For the full list of messianic prophecies, go to www.jesus-is-lord.com slash messiah.htm. We're going to talk about different prophecies that do not involve Jesus in a moment, but let's go back for a second. Jesus did indeed fulfill over 360 ancient prophecies about him. Now, some may say, people just wrote a fictional character that fulfilled all of them, and there's many problems with that theory. One of which is this. One of the prophecies concerning the Messiah is that he was to come before the destruction of the Second Temple, which happened in 70 AD. So, either Jesus Christ is the Messiah, or there is none. You have no other choice. Not to mention, all respected historians will conclude that Jesus was in fact a historical person. No one really disputes that anymore because there's plenty of outside of the Bible evidence of such, such as the Babylonian Talmud, which says Jesus was killed as a sorcerer. The Jewish people at the time, the Pharisees, believed that Jesus was performing miracles by the power of the devil. Jesus said, however, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. So, if Jesus was casting out devils by the power of the devil, how can the devil's kingdom stand if he's working against himself? It doesn't make sense. So, the Jewish Talmud actually acknowledges the existence of Jesus. There is a historical historian named Josephus who talked about Jesus. There was another historian named Tychius, and there's plenty of others. Go to Wikipedia and look it up. You can find them. Some people might accuse Jesus of actually trying to fulfill the prophecies. Here's the problem with that. Most of the prophecies have nothing to do with his own choices, such as he was to be born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, preceded by a forerunner, John the Baptist, to be sold for 30 pieces of silver by a friend, to be crucified, to be risen from the grave. These things are not, you know, things a normal person can orchestrate. So, they have nothing to do with active choices that Jesus could have made. One of the prophecies that Jesus made is that when he returns, he's going to split the Mount of Olives in half from east to west. Recently, hotel builders attempted to build a hotel there, but during topographical studies found a fault line running underneath the Mount of Olives from east to west. So, either Jesus had x-ray vision, or perhaps satellites, 2,000 years ago, and could tell that there was a fault line runner, running underneath the Mount of Olives, or he is God Almighty. Make your choice. Back in the book of Genesis, a prophecy was made about the Arab nation. Ishmael, who was a son of Abraham's, was foretold to be a great nation. And there is no question that the Arab nation is in fact a great nation. They are very numerable. They're, there's billions of them. So, the further prophecy that was made about the Arab nation is that they would be a wild nation and very angry and violent that they would be at war with all of their brethren, and every one of their brethren at war with them. That is most certainly true. The Pope issued a statement saying that Islam was a violent religion. The Islamics said, no, we're not a violent religion, and, they, and then they burned down churches. I don't know.